Warning, the following material is extremely disturbing. On Grave Matter, we try to be as accurate as possible and we collect information from many different sources. We don't condone or glorify murder and we try to be as sensitive as possible to victims and their families while approaching a serious subject matter with a sense of humor. Listener discretion is advised. everybody welcome to episode 15 of the grave matter this is jillian gentry and this is chris lang welcome back we have a wonderful episode lined up for you today episode 15 it's a big milestone for us huh yeah and i our, think so our formats are different every time so uh, get ready to be surprised yeah that's true we're <laughs> that's absolutely true we have kind of a special today we are going to be focusing on one killer whose name is unknown so sorry about that um whoever you are (laughs) um no it's we're gonna be focusing on one specific event it's a very famous event that took place in texarkana texas slash arkansas hence the name in 1946 it is the texarkana moonlight murders and the story of the phantom killer have you heard of it before yeah kind of in passing here and there I thought it was really cool. This has been my favorite story to research so far, except for our first episode. But I'm a history buff, right? So Oh, you like the old-timey ones. I do, I do. Because our first one was, what, 1884 to 1885. I remember that. Christmas to Christmas. And then this one actually takes place in 1946. So I think this is the second oldest one that we've done so far. It kind of is a cross. It, it reminds me of like a cross between the Servant Girl Annihilator and... Angel Resendez in a sense of how the community was affected. Hmm. But we'll talk about that a little bit later. Here's the thing. <laughs> we actually have some updates for you guys. We want to talk about a couple things. Drum roll, please. The Area 51 update. Thank you very do. much. I know. <laughs> you sound like an angry dog. <laughs> <laughs> The Area 51 update, guys. The date is still set for September 20th. Um, I think it's 3 to 6 a.m. We're up to 1.9. 3 to 6 a.m.? Well, yeah, it's, it's under the cover of darkness. Stupid. That's the smartest time to attack. You know, okay. Attack, whatever. Anyways, <laughs> 1.9 million people are dedicated to going. Another 1.6 million are interested. That's over 3 million people. In the United States population, which is as stupid as everybody is today, I'm surprised it's not 50%, you know? Well, I'm surprised I'm, it's not 100 million. I'm supposed to be one of those people, but I'm a liar, so. Well, okay, so. I don't have the funds for travel right now. Okay, so if 99% of 1.9 million is a liar, then what does 0.1% leave? How many people? I don't know, but so many more are liars. Oh, I totally agree. Let's take a look at the numbers real quick. Okay, so if ninety nine percent, if ninety nine point nine percent of people are lying about this, which I think is a pretty good number, the nineteen thousand people are still going to show up. Well, there's <laughs> going to be a lot of empty basements. I'm just saying, I, 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 I'm a firm believer in the fact that this could fix our social security. The Air Force has actually responded to this in an official manner, and they have stated, and I quote: "Try us." <laughs> no, they said they are standing by and ready to protect their assets at all costs. So, and you are not their assets, so stay your ass at the house. <laughs> Damn, that was good. Woo. That was brilliant. Thanks. I thoroughly enjoyed that. <laughs> uh, yeah, they're gonna blow you up. They're gonna blow you up. We're gonna fix Social Security. Everything's gonna be fantastic. You're not gonna find anything. If anybody was actually smart, and I might get killed for this, but let me go on record saying it: you would attack Papoose Lake and not Groom Lake. Because that's where S4 is. Bob Lazar, guys. Come on. Check it out. (laughs) But another update as far as Area 51 is concerned. Over 3 million people are interested, as I've said. So it is now this huge advertising push from all these major companies. And of all of the companies out there, Arby's, the fast food place. We have the meats. They have the meats. For sandwiches. 
<laughs> Jesus. Arby's is sending food trucks to Area 51 to feed everybody, especially the Kyles, because they're going to be expending so much energy. So no, the Kyles are going to be up there with that. And that somebody needs to bring, like, I don't know. Gatorade. No, like, Monster needs to show up with their little panel van. That is a brilliant idea, on for real. I mean, just for marketing purposes, even if, even if no one's there. But Arby's is sending food trucks uh, to feed these people, even if, like, I guess they ran the numbers of 0.1 people still show up. That's still 20,000. So, um, you know. Well, you know, these guys are not eating one sandwich. <laughs> that is. <laughs> <that's> <laughs> They're doing that faux fo faux fo 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 You know, that's, it's, that's very possible. Um, I'm really interested to see what's going to happen. I don't know, man. Even if a thousand people show up, you know, what's going to happen? Are they just going to take pictures and leave? Or is it going to be a big party? Or is the government going to show up and kill everyone? Like, I don't know, man. I could see all of that happening in the same night. I can see us hearing absolutely nothing until like a few people here and there are like, my son went to Area 51 and he hasn't returned. Has anybody seen him? There's definitely going to be some weird stories that come out of it, right? We're going to hear a lot of, of alien butthole probing stories yeah there's gonna be some weird shit out there you know what i mean some not real shit i wonder if there will be any serial killers involved i mean someone's missing oh it must have been area 51 (laughs) et i don't know et seems like a pretty nice guy but you know that that alien versus predator guy he seems pretty they said bent on they said they should send all the child molesters out there so that way when the when they fight it's alien versus predator yeah yeah i'm I'm rooting for the aliens in this case (laughs) yeah i mean i think we all are honestly and that you know hey if we could get rid of them and save social security and find out about aliens and get rid of a bunch of arby's whoa what's that a fucking that's a that's a quadro move right there quattro that's a quad win throwing it out there quad win Another thing I want to talk about, I want you to touch on. There was some weird story going around the internet about like a, what was it? Like a medical research facility that did some weird shit. What's up with that? Yeah, it was like a, in Arizona, I believe. Uh-huh. Yeah. They were. Um, it's too hot for mis- people to be sane there. Misbehaving. Am I right? Was it a medical research facility? Yeah, it was like where you donate your body to science, I guess. Uh, I just briefly read it. I didn't really prepare to talk about it, but. From what That's I remember okay. on the, uh, the article I read about it was very disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> so they found like buckets of body parts, heads. They stitched body parts together like Frankenstein the shit out of some like different, folks. Like from different people? Yeah. And so some guy was like, he donated his mother and his grandmother's bodies to science there. They, they elected to have it done before they passed How away. How did he donate it? Well, they, they had Okay, he was in charge of the transfer. Whatever. Yeah. Um, it's not your decision, bro. And they were told that they were going to be used to, like, uh, try to, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, testing for cancer, like, curing cancer and things okay. like that. And he's like, I don't think that they ever really did anything like that with them. Um, Is and this just, like, one company that ran the place that was, like, fucked up or something? I guess so. I certainly, I read that they certainly had, seems that way. They had, like a tor- like, a man's torso tacked to the wall or something. And I'm just like... If I come to work and that's happening, I'm probably going to take a sick day, you know? That's terrible. Um, but yeah, they were doing some weird shit. And the guy that donated, that his mother and grandmother wound up there, after this whole story came, broke or whatever, um, their ashes were delivered to his house. And he's like, they probably aren't even them or only them. You know, like he has no oh idea what's God. in there. So he's like, I don't know what to do with this. And to be honest with you, I'm actually an organ donor. So I'm actually pretty concerned at some stuff like that. Furthermore, I have heard rumors and I, (laughs) this is the weirdest shit. This is so, this is personal. I'm an organ donor and I have like a clause in there that says, don't touch my eyes. I'm like, get away from my face (laughs) because here's the thing. I've heard that your brain can have activity for up to 10 days after you die. And I'm like, just in case. I, I can. What are you gonna do? Sit up and look at your empty torso? I don't know. I just don't. No, not with no eyes. I'm not. So I'd rather. I don't know, man. I don't know. I just don't want anyone touching in my face. They can have whatever they want of mine, but they're not gonna want that shit. I use my stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Being real. 
used Jill for sale. <laughs> nothing recyclable here. This is all sa- not nothing salvageable. <laughs> well, it's concerning, nevertheless. <laughs> I think that's terrifying. But that's interesting. Those are our, what do you call them? Let's come up with something clever. Those are our murder fucking blah, blah, blah updates. I don't know. This is our, po- our, our pre-mortem. <laughs> Yeah, so that's our pre-mortem updates for the day, I guess. <laughs> well, we're going to do po- post-mortem next. So. Yeah, post-mortem following the story. So let's go ahead and dive into the story of the day, The Phantom Killer, also known as The Phantom Slayer in direct relation to the Texarkana Moonlight Murders, as the media uh, called it, right? So this is a super famous case. This took place in Texarkana, Texas slash Arkansas in 1946. Um, This was just an overview. It was a series of violent attacks that resulted in five people being killed and three people being gravely injured. It's certainly not the most as far as a body count is concerned, but what I found really striking about this in particular was how it enveloped the entire town in a blanket of fear. The community was pulled, they pulled together, but they were, they were all frightened. Um, it was it was it was insane. So the crimes still remain unsolved to this day, which makes it super mysterious, right? Obviously, however, they think they know, and I, I agree with them. Uh, they know who was responsible out of the few spe- suspects that they've gathered. Two in particular. Uh, the crimes took place over a three month period. That's it. it. Was actually not even a full three months. It was ten weeks. Wow, that's uh, pretty. It's pretty rare, right? Yeah, I mean, if he'd have kept going at that pace. He- could have been really, which had, makes had, me had a really heavy body count. Yeah, you're not kidding. It makes me wonder why he stopped. You know what I mean? But it was it was a very quick period of time. It took place um, late February, February 22nd of 1946, and ended on May 3rd of 1946. But yeah, like I said, what really gets my attention is is how shook the town one. It, it was it was worse than anyone had ever seen before. Now, in order to fully understand and appreciate the depth and the gravity of this situation. Let's take a trip back to 1946 and understand what the vibe was like, okay? Mm -hmm. So I want to paint a picture of post-war optimism in America, okay? World War II ended in late August of 1945. Everybody came home. Everybody was ridiculously excited. The armistice was August 14th. Japan's official surrender was September 2nd, 1945, six months before these attacks that I'm about to talk about. Um, we, you know, we bombed Japan. It was August 6th and August 9th. We dropped the A-bomb. So the entire country was ecstatic. There was a, a deep sense of nationalism, patriotism uh, as our soldiers returned home. It wasn't like, you know, Vietnam or anything like that. They were basically considered heroes. Uh, we knew at that point that we were the greatest country in the world and it paved the way for a massive boom in the economy and a huge shift in industry, right? So there was never, the point is, is there was never a better time in America. Everyone always thinks about customer service and like the 1950s, right? This was the start of that, you know, dirty industrial jobs from the industrial revolution were giving way to better working conditions and, and white collar service jobs and people were making money hand over fist um, the working conditions, like I said, were greatly improved and the credit system was about to be introduced. So mm. everything was optimistic. Um, the credit system was a big deal in the fifties because they had all these new appliances and shit for like housewives and People it allowed, could finance them. yeah, it allowed everyone to purchase it. Right. So it's kind of been talked out, talked about as the downfall of our economy in the mm-hmm. long run. But at the time, everybody was so optimistic about it. And this was a national feeling. This is six months after the end of the war. The World War. Now, Texarkana at the time was a very small, well-connected, and prosperous town. So there was only about 20,000 people. There's only about 40,000 now. It hasn't grown that much, but this was like the peak of the town. Mm -hmm. 20,000 people, and it was a bustling little town. There was a downtown area with, you know, the movie and the marquee lights and the big bulbs and, you know, picture it like that. The malt Mm -hmm. shop, right? That kind of stuff. Like Back to the Future? Right. Okay. Yeah, sort of, except not like that. That, but more country. It's in Texas, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's But it's one of those towns where everyone knows everyone, and it still seems like that to this day, to be honest. 
I lived, I've lived in a couple places like that. Really? Mm-hmm. Texarkana is an interesting place. There's a river that runs right down the middle of the city. Uh, well, it's a creek. And then the other one side is Arkansas, one side is Texas, and it's right in the middle of the town. Um, so that being said, painting the picture of post-war optimism, Texarkana still had a lot of problems. There was a lot of crime uh, in the area. There was a rough side. There was a lot of whiskey-fueled bar fights and domestic disturbances and disputes uh, between husbands and wives. Most of the time, alcohol was involved. You know, once again, kind of reminiscent of the servant girl annihilator, there were stabbings and shootings uh, pretty often. But it was never really a surprise to anyone. As, opt- as optimistic as the country was, you know, Texarkana had a lot of hardworking, kind of roughneck laborer types, farmers vets from the war that had ptsd that nobody had diagnosed yet you know what i mean Mm. a lot of brawls farmers were actually going through a particular rough time because of the shift in the industry so because of the area that they were in although the general vibe was optimistic there were there was a lot of crime and a lot of problems so conflicting landscape right right the point of that is is that that might have played a part in slowing the investigations down of, of these events particularly because they were like, oh, there's crime anyway. So one thing happened and they were like, okay. And then two things happened and they were like, okay. And then three things happened and they were like, oh, shit. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about the actual attacks. And I say attacks because they were not all murders. Anyways, the first one, as I said before, was February 22nd, 1946. Year of our Lord. It in- What? <laughs> the year of our Lord, 19... 19- 46, 1946 A.D. Anos Domini. Mm, 25-year-old Jimmy Hollis and 19-year-old, this is the dumbest name ever, Mary Larry. Wow. I see why she went by Mary Jean, Larry. Um, Why would you do that to your daughter? I've seen some shit in my time. (laughs) People name their kids some ridiculous shit. Yeah, but Mary Larry, okay. Um, they go on a double date with Jimmy's brother, Bob, who's also an insurance salesman and his girlfriend. They go to the movies. Uh, they watch their little cinema and after the movie, the Nickelodeon and after the movie, he drops off his brother, Bob and his girlfriend. And then he was going to take Mary Larry home. Right. Cause I have to say that, <laughs> um, before he dropped her off, they went to a semi 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 secluded area off of Richmond Road on the northwest side of the city, which is still there, by the way. Richmond Road. I believe they were attempting to involve themselves in some post-war hanky-panky shenanigans. <laughs> this oh, is, no, not that. <laughs> you know what I mean? They had a great time at the Nickelodeon. Some grab ass. <laughs> they grabbed some malts, and they went for some grab ass shenanigans, hanky-panky, post-war unbeknownst to them as they were hanky panking a shadowy figure appeared at the car window with a gun hold on a second was he hanking and she was panking or how does that work so i think that she was in the process of being panked with his hanky with his hanky well hell okay carry on yeah so shadowy figure appears at the car window with the gun and he has a whitewashed bag or a burlap sack over his face with the eyes cut out. So he went on down to the Hobby Lobby and got himself some supplies. If that's a thing, yeah. So I what's mean, that movie where they're all in like, it's, it's like the KKK and they all have the bags over their heads? The Jang- Django. It's in Django. It was a bag like that. God damn it, I can't see out of my eye holes. <laughs> that, it was like that, right? I laughed so hard. Oh my God, that's a great movie. It was a great idea. It was poor execution. Maybe we don't do the bags this time. <laughs> He has that on his head, a burlap sack, and he orders them out of the car. And as they get out of the car, he has Jimmy, the boyfriend, obviously, take his pants off. He goes, take your pants off. They weren't already? They were not. What about his hanky? Perhaps it was a custom-built pants suit. I don't know. What a gentleman. (laughs) What a gentleman. So he he says, take your pants off. And as Jimmy is taking his pants off, as they're around his ankles and he's unbalanced, he starts bashing him in the skull. So it was just a ruse to get him distracted and off balance. He 
hits him in the skull a couple times and renders him unconscious. He was hit so hard that Mary thought it was gunshots. That it was the his skull his cracking open. Oh my god. Yeah. So at that point, he orders Mary out of the car. He's out, right? Potentially dead. He orders Mary out of the car, who actually tried to argue with him. Uh, not smart. Last ditch effort, whatever. Well, she was saying they were poor and they had nothing of value, assuming that it was a robbery. And so, uh, kind of weird. He says, okay, and tells her to run. He's like, run away. And don't ever say anything. And she's like, fucking roger that and starts <laughs> and starts running. And as she starts running, so does he. What? And he chases her down and hits her, <laughs> knocking her what? down. He then proceeded to sexually assault her with the barrel of his gun. Damn. Yeah. yeah. That's no hanky. That sucks. Yeah. I hate um, it. Now, at that point, another car approaches on Richmond Road. With the headlights on. And Jimmy, because of the headlights, Jimmy starts to wake up, right? Mm -hmm. He somehow regains consciousness. He's bleeding everywhere. But as soon as the headlights shine on the scene, the attacker runs. He leaves. He completely dips out. Both of the victims survived. Well, that's good. It's something anyway. Yeah, it is something. So Jimmy was basically non-responsive for like a week. I bet they never even heard of crimes like that back then. You know what I mean? Well, like, so kind of what I said, the precursor to this, it was a violent town and it hindered the investigation in my opinion. And and this is why. So he wound up, Jimmy wound up spending 12 days in the hospital and was unconscious for a week, but there was very little police response. Nobody, they had conflicting descriptions that they gave the police officer. Uh, She thought it was a black guy and he thought it was a white guy, but very dark skinned. So... It's either it was a potato sack. It was a potato sack. So it's either not a super black guy and not a super white guy is what it sounds like at this point. But the police response was minimal. They kind of took a statement and were like, all right, well, you know, if we see fucking burlap man running around. But I mean, there was really nothing to follow up on. Hmm. Fast forward catchphrase about a month later, almost to the day. And what's up with that, by the way? What's up with our line food? <laughs> With what's up with people killing in intervals? You know what I mean? Like, we've had so many people that it's like one month later, almost to the day, fucking the Servant Girl Annihilator, our first episode that we did, was almost a year to the day, you know, of of the entire events that took place. It's, it's probably like a, a release when they kill somebody is and it they like have a, to ramp back up. Um, is it like a cycle? Like Trinity? You know what I mean? It's probably more like, a, okay, it's time, you know, like. Or do you think do you think it's like something that boils up in them until they can't take it, and then that's the average amount of time that it takes to lose control? Like, think about it, you know? Yeah, I'm not sure. I think the way I look at it is kind of like um, like doing a drug. You know, you take drugs, and then a certain amount of time goes by, and it's time to do it again. You know, it's but interesting that it's it's like an ad- adrenaline rush. Mm-hmm. Maybe I have to prepare mentally for it. I don't. I'm not really sure. I wonder if I it's guess. on purpose. You know, I guess if I knew the real answers, you might have to be suspicious of me. Oh, suspicious. Yeah, it's it's just weird to me. But one month later, ultimately, once again, March 24th of 1946, uh, early morning, they find a car, the police. Uh, and inside is 29-year-old Richard L. Griffin and 17-year-old Polly Ann Moore, which is a very 1950s name, by the way. Both of them, really, even though it's 46. Uh, they were both dead. They were both shot in the back of their heads and were found in their 1941 Oldsmobile on Lover's Lane. It's weird that the first time he used his gun only as a, a club, you know, and didn't fire it at all. Right. It is weird. And it's not even known that it's the same person if it's unsolved. You know what I mean? Um, the interesting thing about finding these two in the car is that Richard was up front. He was holding his head. So he, he was between the driver's seat and the passenger seat on that area crouched on his knees curled up holding his head with two gunshot wounds to the back of his head so he was probably expecting it and his pockets were turned out hmm interesting polly on the other hand was in the back seat laid and kind of displayed there which they later determined that she was maybe 
place there after being sexually assaulted on a blanket outside of the car. There was some evidence that that took place. They did find 32 caliber rounds from a Colt that were fired. Mm -hmm. And at this point, the police started paying attention, barely. They they did start paying attention, but they received over 100 tips from 50 different people. This town is Gossip Town, USA, okay? They received over 100 tips from 50 different people in the following days that the news released the story. And I think because of that, the waters were muddied and they determined this was also an isolated incident. And keep in mind, there's bar fights, people are getting stabbed. There's other stuff. This is a small police force in a tight town. Um, and it, it's just not connected yet, right? Doesn't sound exactly quaint, the town. So there's a map similar to what we were looking at with the servant girl annihilator back then. And it was about the same size. So it was maybe like 15 blocks by 10 blocks. Mm-hmm. I, I counted. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it wasn't that big. There was really like a big giant rail yard or something. And then there was kind of a little downtown district, which spread the entire length of 15 blocks. But it was only the first couple blocks deep, right? And then the rest of it was like houses, just suburban surroundings. It wasn't that big of an area. But uh, that happened. Nobody was really concerned other than the fact that some terrible shit had happened in town. But nobody was in fear at that point. We then go to March 4th. I'm sorry, April 14th of 1946. Once again, about a month later, three weeks later, two more bodies show up. This time, it's 15-year-old Betty Jo Booker, 1950s name. Yeah. And 16-year-old Paul Martin. They were out that night. They were last seen, actually, at 1.30 in the morning. They were leaving a musical performance at the local uh, the Veterans of Foreign War post, the VFW post, where uh, Betty Jo played saxophone. She was in the band, and she was entertaining the uh, veterans. Hmm. That reminds me of something else, too. What? I don't know if it was the Zodiac. Oh, oh, Maybe it was the Zodiac remember. killer. Okay. I don't remember which killer, but one of these victims or whatever uh, was in a band's... I think she might have One played. of the victims? Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know. But it's the story is really reminiscent of a lot of different situations that I found. And it it's it's probably been my favorite one to research so far because of that. Um, she did play saxophone in the band. They were last seen at 1.30 in the morning. And then, once again, they found him the next morning. Paul had been shot four times in the head. And Betty was also dead. She had been raped and shot twice. They actually were found separately. She was found about a mile away. They're kind of back in the sticks anyway, but this was, you know, a mile up the road in a wooded area. Hmm. She was found. She had been raped and shot twice. Once again, recovered the rounds 32 caliber Colt. At this point, everything changed. The police are, they see a pattern. When they when they matched the bullets, they went, oh, shit. The community flipped out. The newspaper immediately reported on it. It was the uh, Texarkana Gazette, and they immediately ran a story saying the Phantom Killer strikes again, right? They named him the Phantom Killer, which is why they say media coined. Hmm. Um, citizens immediately started taking action. They, they freaked the fuck out instantly. Uh, word spread, and they had this weird plan. I mean, people people traveled in groups together. That wasn't that weird. But what was weird was there was a hotel in the middle of the city called Apley, the Hotel Grimm. Huh. Terrible name. Where children would stay together for the day while their parents were at, the, were at work. If they weren't at school. I don't know how school worked back then. But there was a community gathering of people in the hotel every day so that nobody was by themselves. Hmm. That's how affected the town was. There was actually a town curfew that was imposed by the small police department that was there. Liquor stores started closing early at 930, which makes me wonder how late they were open in the first place. Right. Um, people started calling in every noise imaginable, overwhelming the police force. Right. So the police now know that they have some some their due diligence to, to perform. Right. They, there's, they have to do something. People are paying attention. But they're completely overwhelmed by these bullshit calls. One lady, to put it in perspective, called the cops on a cow standing in the yard because it had a white face and it frightened her and she didn't know what it was. Uh, somebody else, the wind blew their bushes up against their house and they called the police. Um, the police were called on a guy waiting at a bus stop because he was by himself and they were like, that's suspicious. There was a kid that was almost killed, a 17-year-old. He was following a bus 
and the police started chasing him and he freaked out. It was an undercover car that started chasing him, right? He ran and here's how it went down. They caught up with the kid about to kill him and he said, I thought I saw the phantom killer get on the bus. I was chasing him. The police said, we were chasing you because we thought you were the phantom killer. And he said, I ran from you because you're in an unmarked car and I thought you might be the phantom killer. <laughs> so <laughs> it was absolute fucking chaos, right? Yeah. Um, some businesses dropped by 20%. People were losing sales except for two types of businesses. The gun store sold out, had the best three months of their life. <laughs> And the hardware store sold out because people were making booby traps in their fucking house, like Home Alone, <laughs> trying to catch this guy. Um, but a lot they had of homemade, dogs you know, they adopted. didn't have deadbolts and, and all that kind of stuff back then. They started making their own locks, which makes me wonder, you know, what the fuck was going on with that? <laughs> um, it seems like a, it was truly a scary time in the area, you know? Once again, this is about three weeks later. It's getting quicker now. We go to May 3rd of 1946, right? So let's look at the dates. We had February 22nd. We had March 24th. Then we had April 14th. And now we have May 3rd. It's getting closer, right? Mm -hmm. They're getting closer together. So this is actually a very different situation. 37-year-old Virgil Starks was a farmer and sort of a disgruntled farmer. They were having a tough time, right? Remember back in this, in this area, in this era. Uh, he was at home, and he was listening to his favorite radio show, sitting in his chair. Imagine that, you know what I mean, 1940s, you know, got a paper in his lap, whatever, got a whiskey, listening to his favorite radio show when a 22 caliber bullet flies through the window, striking him in the head. Jesus. And he did not see it coming at all. His wife was in the bedroom, didn't hear any gunshots, which is kind of typical of a 22, but heard glass breaking. And thought, oh, he dropped a coffee cup, uh, he dropped a plate, you know, what what the hell? And so she goes out to the kitchen where she thinks he's at, doesn't see him, goes out to the living room. And he's slumped over in his chair, unresponsive and bleeding. At this point, she goes white. And she freaks out, you know what I mean? As anybody would. And her name's Katie, by the way, the wife. She freaked out. She ran to the phone to contact the authorities, which probably took about 10 minutes on one of those fucking rotary phones. You know what I mean? She got a couple numbers into the dial when once again, bullets fly through the window, two shots, one into her head, one into her mouth. And in the one that shot her in the mouth, blew her teeth out of the front of her mouth. Damn. Yeah. Katie bar the door. <laughs> Wouldn't have done you any good, but you know. Yeah, no, it's totally nuts. It, it it came through her face and it pushed the teeth out of her mouth. You want to hear something even crazier? Sure. She survived. Um, the guy, after shooting, started breaking in through one of the windows. And as she was bleeding, she was holding her face. She ran out of the front door to a neighbor's house. Keep in mind they're on a fucking farm. This is a far run mm -hmm. after you've been shot in the face twice, especially. Um, now, it's a twenty two. It's a small bullet, but she's bleeding out of the face. She runs to a neighbor's house who then threw her in the truck and took her to the hospital where they discovered, get this, a bullet stuck under her tongue. The one that shot her in the mouth. Wow. Virgil did not make it. He was dead already. Now, at this point, because the entire town was aware, 20 to 30 cops, basically the entire police force, damn near everyone, showed up in an attempt to collect evidence. There are rumors that they didn't collect evidence because there were so many people that it was sloppy and everything got fucked up and mm -hmm. typical shit with lots of humans. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They did find bloody footprints that disappeared into a nearby field. They lost the track. They had no idea what happened. It just stopped and they got nothing. The blood probably wiped off their shoes. <laughs> Potentially. So at this point, it hits the news. The town goes on fucking red alert. DEFCON 4. <laughs> people start... I'm serious. People start boarding up their houses like a Florida fucking hurricane. People start... <laughs> they, they literally put two by fours. They, it's 1940. They go to, they go to Home Depot. <laughs> yeah, Home Depot. No, but they start they boarding Earl's up... Earl's Hardware. <laughs> Earl's Hardware. Sold out, right? They start boarding up the windows and, and they nail their fucking windows shut, which is terrible for a fire, by the way. 
I can just picture them ripping down their fences and <laughs> around their property. <laughs> you know what I mean? Boarding up their house. It was red alert. Um, the people, there was this common thing. That, I guess, I don't know if there were town meetings that decided this or what. Um, I, I, there certainly were town meetings about it, you know. Um, they had they started bringing in additional police forces, sim- similar to, um, once again, Servant Girl Annihilators, right? So they started bringing in Texas Rangers, U.S. Marshals, mm. whatever the fucking FBI was back then, which it wasn't, I don't think. Um, I think the FBI was started in the 50s. Oh, yeah. Because of this reason. No, I'm just... <laughs> um, with... Uh, was it J. Edgar Hoover, the guy that made vacuum cleaners? I think that's the one. Of course. So... They had this town meeting, and it was then common practice for if you showed up at a friend's house, you would have to announce yourself. If you didn't announce yourself, they would shoot you on sight. Hmm. So it was people were getting shot. Say, people were shooting many... at police officers. Police officers had to have their sirens on because the cars looked different back then. They weren't as obvious. And so... You know, a police officer would show up to question somebody about a theft or something. And the guy would be like, announce yourself and start shooting at him. You know what I mean? Makes me wonder how many people were killed by other people. Like the his body count could have been like 75, but he only actually killed five. You know what I mean? Yeah, true. But he was right? responsible like, for like, the other deaths right, because exactly. of the circumstances. Mm-hmm. And that's probably true. Um, if we look, if we were to look at the crime statistics or the statistics of how many people died back then, I would say, yeah, you're pretty fucking right on. Kind of like yelling fire in a theater. Yeah, exactly. Now, law enforcement had got together. They had their own version of a Texarkana task force, right? And which w- was not very efficient, by the way. The police started dressing up as young couples and hanging out in secluded areas trying to get caught. I wondered when they were going to do that. Yeah, they they started doing that. And one of the documentaries I watched was really funny. It was the it was the BuzzFeed guys, and they talked about um, like how bad it's like how those cowboy motherfuckers dressing up as what do they do? Is like a six foot three burly guy with a mustache and his fucking prom suit with like another six foot three guy with a mustache with a wig on <laughs> like i thought that was pretty funny not very convincing they started hanging out in secluded areas some of the officers even brought their real wives uh no with loaded way. guns so if that was you you know i don't know i mean i'd be game i'd be like let's do this yeah you fucking would too you'd mm. probably bring a cattle prod or something you wouldn't even be humane about it <laughs> i'd film it <laughs> you know what i mean um the thing is is it didn't work at all at this point, like I said, there were multiple agencies involved. Nobody's ideas of either collecting evidence, trying to catch this guy, following leads, nothing fucking worked. And it stopped. Everything just stopped. Hmm. Now, here's the question. Why? Was it because maybe he was about to attack somebody and found out that it was a police officer? Obviously, the guy knew what was going on if he's living in this small town. Maybe he got killed. I don't think so. I don't think so. Maybe he got arrested for another crime. That's true. We are going to get into, in just a second, the theories revolving the suspects. Mm -hmm. Okay? I think the suspect was alive and well in this town the entire time and was aware of the investigations. Um, I think he got off on the media attention. He also was insane, in my opinion. Do you think he was a cop? No, I don't. Okay. I don't, because they've pretty much identified who it was, and he was not a police officer. Mm. Um, the special agents, because it stopped, right? The, over the next few months, the fear started to dissipate as nothing new unfolded. And the special agents and you know marshals and rangers kind of started leaving town very quietly and unannounced. Kind of like our military in Iraq. (laughs) When we pulled out, like, we weren't trying to have a baby. Anyways, nothing (laughs) happened after. Like, what the fuck? The case was never solved, which obviously makes it interesting as fuck and one of my favorite things to talk about. But, like I said, let's talk about some of the theories associated with the primary suspects, right? There's really two, and that's it. Mm. And it's really interesting because... We're pretty sure that it's one, but the other one really brings up a lot of questions. So let's bring up the questionable one first. Now, this guy, the random man, his name is H.B. Tennyson. 
which sounds like he writes fucking novels, uh, scary or kills ones, people. or kills people. But here's the thing. His nickname, what he went by, Duty. Super terrifying. Yeah. Like, mm, <laughs> not super convincing, dude. I think the Phantom Killer is way better than Duty. Um, <laughs> LOL. <laughs> he. <laughs> Did you actually write LOL? No. Um, no, I didn't. It looks like it though. I think it, I think it's look. <laughs> oh, maybe that is LOL. <laughs> <laughs> it says duty with an arrow pointing at it and it says LOL behind the arrow. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I did write that in my research. Okay. <laughs> Kevin freaking Davis. Kevin freaking Davis. We write what we think. Yeah. Here's another thing about duty. <laughs> duty killed himself. He shot himself. Hmm. And he left a what note. What kind of gun did he use? Touche, right? Dun, dun, dun. But a lot of people had a lot of guns back then. But I don't know. <laughs> he did kill himself, and he left a note admitting to the murders of Paul and Betty Joe, as well as the attack at the farmhouse on Virgil and Katie Starks. Um, well, those were the two that were kind of different from the others, weren't they? The Virgil and Katie Starks were different than the other ones. Paul and Betty Joe were on Lover's Lane. That's regular. So, But they were... The, it's weird that... They were killed outright, though, right? They're the ones with the gunshots. The one was in the front seat, and one was in the back seat. Right. That well, was the one first of them. ones. He just clubbed them with the gun, so it's different. The first one he was clubbed with the gun. So actually, no, Paul. Paul was found outside of his car. Okay. And uh, Betty Joe. There, there was. It was one of the other ones where they were found in the car together. Okay. But it was a similar mo's at the at the uh, lovers' lane area, mm. right? And they were both shot. Um, the only one who wasn't shot was the first one. Okay. Now, it was weird, and it threw detectives for a loop that this happened for a couple different reasons. They initially thought that the Starks incident was separate. The guys in the farmhouse. Mm-hmm. Because it was a twenty two caliber bullet. Right. It was a completely different bullet. It wasn't in Lover's Lane. These it was were a long range gun, right? I mean, not. It was actually a twenty two pistol, so oh, okay. it wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't a I was rifle. Say maybe he needed to. No, he was standing outside the window on the porch, and that's what he shot him through. What a butthole! I know, right? So, it was a twenty two versus a thirty two, a uh, completely different bullet. The two, the couple was older. He was thirty seven. You know what I mean? They were in their home. They were in their home. They weren't on a lover's lane. It was a different area. And they're thinking, and it was the last one, so they're thinking maybe it was like a copycat that somebody who hated them that didn't want to get caught, right? But he absolutely admitted to it. But Hmm. the question remains, why would someone kill themselves but only admit to two if they're all connected? Because the police thought all the Lover Lane killings are connected, and this one's separate. But he's only admitting to one of the Lover Lane killings and this separate incident, so it's fucking weird. A lot of people didn't take it seriously, especially the investigators. Until his cousin, who is a psychologist, by the way. Plot twist. His cousin, who's a psychologist in the area, Dr. John Tennyson, confirmed that he knew all the victims. He was like, um, well, here's the thing. He actually knew everybody in some way, shape, or form. But then I think to myself, okay, but how strange is that in a small, small town? town yeah. You know what I mean? Here's the thing. He worked at the movies as as an usher. He was, you know, he's a younger guy. He worked as an usher, so which is seen all these couples coming. He from saw movies. well, and it was the last place a lot of them had been before they were found dead. Right. He worked at the movies. He played in the high school band with Betty Joe. Even even with that, and this goes back to one of the documentaries I was watching. They said, well. There was never enough evidence to convict this guy. Nothing ever matched, even even with that. So there was something that caused them to throw this case out. The big conspiracy is, is the note that he left real? There is a lot of talk that the note was fabricated by law enforcement to provide some type of closure to the town because the mayor was pissed. Um, this had, By the time this event had gone down, it had already reached Oklahoma. Um, It was getting attention in New York City, right? I mean, it was national news at this point. Right. Which in 1940 is a big fucking deal. You know what I mean? Um, So, yeah, there was talk that the note was fabricated by law enforcement in order to provide some type of solution. And they knew that this fit. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. 
that he had some connection to everybody in some way. But so does everyone in that town, you know? Right. Well, they went to the same high school. Well, yeah, so did everyone else in that fucking town. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I don't know. What do you think? Do you I think don't know. it's plausible that law enforcement would do something like that? I fucking do. I mean, it's plausible, but it's not what my instincts tell me. Yeah. I think maybe there was more than one killer. That's an interesting idea. Let's talk about the next guy, the real guy that I think is the killer. Okay. I think he's a killer just because his name is terrible. His <laughs> 29-year-old UL Lee Swinney. Three names. <laughs> <laughs> Guilty. Yep, right? right off the bat. Um, many people, I would say most people, believe that he is the culprit, that he is guilty. There was a state trooper in Arkansas by the name of Max Stackett, which is kind of cool. <laughs> that um, is a cool name. Right? Max Stackett. That's an action hero name. That's, Why didn't I realize that earlier? That's a pretty cool freaking that's name. That's going to be my porn name. <laughs> Max oh, Stackett. Well, I'll make sure to avoid those titles. <laughs> okay. Keep an eye out, guys. Max Stackett Stack noted that there were always, and this is honestly just good police work on his part, that he noted there were always cars reported stolen near the attacks on the date. The same date of the attacks, right? Yeah. Um, same location, same time. The cops, he, he shared that information. The cops caught wind of it. And what he did is he started... Well, I don't know if it was him specifically, but other officers started staking out parking lots near the area, right? Yeah. Um, Close to a month out, or I don't know if they were doing it 24-7, but guess what the fuck they found? Old three-namer trying to steal a car? Nope. Okay, then I don't know. June 28th, 1946. Good old three-namer's wife stealing cars. His wife? Or his fiance at this time, Peggy Swinney, stealing whips. They arrest her, and they're like, "The fuck, bitch. <laughs> she confesses immediately. She goes, it's my husband. He's the killer. And they're like, oh, shit, for real? <laughs> um, <laughs> she's like, yeah, it's, 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 it's him. And told them with intense detail about all these stories. She told several people about how he did this, and her story never changed. The, but she constantly changed her story about her level of involvement. So there is conflicting information, but it's all this bitch. Mm-hmm. She, uh, it, it did change as she discussed herself. So she stated straight up that they had went to the park together to drink the night that Paul and Betty was shot. Right. Mm-hmm. And he said they were in the car together. They were drinking and he was like, Hey, I got to go take a leak. And she was like, Okay. And then he was gone for a fucking hour. It's the longest piss in history. For an hour. And not only that, but she heard a couple gunshots in the distance. Or what sounded like it. Um, After the gunshots, a very hurried UL runs back to the car, gets in, and peels the fuck out. She also noticed that his pants were wet. They were soaked in water up to his thighs. The hell? It's the deepest piss I've ever seen, too. (laughs) (laughs) You know what I mean? Um, And she has these intense details about the stories. We'll fast forward to July 24th, 1946, once again, about a month later. Um, And she tells the story, well, you all said we were going to rob someone, and I tagged along. uh, And begins to tell the story of Paul and Betty Jo's murder. Completely conflicting information. He... She says that he pulled a gun on the couple and then told her to rob them. She's like, search him. And she was like, "Uh, no, fool, that's your thing. (laughs) Like, You know what I mean? Like, she was like not having it at all. Um, I'm just a spectator. I'm a spectator. He was like, fuck that. The funniest word in the world. He got pissed. And within 10 seconds, he shoots Paul in the head twice. Right? Paul goes down. And obviously, he's, he's, he's dead or he's out. Um. She's then a little more willing to cooperate <laughs> yeah. at that point. And uh, Peggy held down Betty Joe while he went and got their car and brought it over. Okay. You tracking? Mm-hmm. So at this point, as the car comes back, he's trying to get Betty Joe in his car. And as the headlights hit him, there's some reviving fucking capacity of headlights that I'm not aware of. Paul, after getting <laughs> shot twice in the head, starts to wake up again. Um. And he's like, fuck that. He shoots him twice more, right? 
They then drove to a secluded area about a mile away, and Peggy stayed in the car as Yule took Betty out of the car and uh, a few hundred yards away into the woods. Not good for Betty. Not good for Betty. He, quote, tried to get some with Betty, and when she refused, he decided to shoot her as well, twice in the back of the head. So she's shifting stories. This is the same murder she's talking about. That, oh, he did everything. And then she's like, oh, and I was there. <laughs> huh. um, but she had facts about the scenes of the crime that only somebody who was there would know. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the biggest ones was she says, yeah, we, we, we were going through the car. I remember specifically throwing a book into this part of the woods. Sure enough, one of the sheriffs had found Paul's book in the bushes right where she fucking said. Hmm. And it's like. Um, okay, so that's kind of a confirmation of sorts, right? It was enough evidence to arrest Yule. But get this. They were engaged, right? They had gotten married like three hours, the ceremony, like the legal ceremony at the courthouse, three hours before Yule was arrested. So it's like spousal privilege. Can't be forced to testify. Exactly. Mm. Isn't that fucking something? Mm-hmm. Like three fucking hours. Like how long did the fucking warrant take? How did they know? You know what I mean? Unfucking believable. Um, he was taken to a. This is the craziest shit. He was actually taken to a facility in Little Rock, Arkansas, after he was arrested, mm-hmm. and they used fucking truth serum on him, which sodium pent- pentothal. Is yeah, that what it's called? sodium sodium pentothal. It is. Yeah, and it didn't work, so they gave him more, and he overdosed on truth <laughs> serum. <laughs> and he was like, I don't know all the mysteries of the world. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> area 51, Area 51, Arby's, Arby's. He fuck- they mismanaged the dose and he fucking went unconscious. This did not play in the prosecutor's favor. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> However. He comes, he wakes up and he's like, when I was eight, I spied on my sister when she was changing. You know what I mean? like, wait, fast forward a little hold while. Hold on, hold the fuck up. <laughs> scramble, scramble. <laughs> he... The judge hated him so much that he gave him life in prison anyway for stealing cars. Evidence, shm evidence. <laughs> evidence, shm evidence. He got life in prison for being a habitual criminal and <laughs> like stealing that. too many cars. I like it. Because they knew he was guilty at that yeah. point. The, in, in my eyes, he's obviously guilty. You know what I mean? But what about the other dude? I That makes me think the police maybe fabricated something. Maybe. I um and maybe he really did kill the couple that run their house because it didn't fit with the rest of them anyway. Yeah, that's true. I mean, who knows, right? Or maybe it was a completely other different person that nobody has any idea about. You know what I mean? Someone that tried to use this story as a cover up. Mm-hmm. Uh, he got life in prison anyway for being a habitual criminal, quote unquote. You're just a dick, so no more freedom for you, okay? Yeah, for real. Due to multiple car thefts, he was actually. So this was in what 1947. He was released on parole in 1973, and uh, he died 21 years later in a nursing home in Dallas, Texas. So, he was an old man, and uh, that fucking blows my mind in itself. My grandma's in a nursing home, you know what I mean? I Go to, like, any type of care facility and imagine that any of those people are a serial killer. and Like, that's fucking mind-blowing. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's going to come up in our favorite television program. <laughs> oh, is it? Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, all in all, it remains unsolved, right? Um, technically. Technically. Quote, unquote. Disclaimer. <laughs> it does remain unsolved. Uh, a couple cool facts about the case. There was actually a movie made in 1976 called The Town That Dreaded Sundown. I've heard of that. It was loosely based on these events, right? And it was very popular. It was very popular. There's none like it. <laughs> um, there was a remake in 2014. Fun fact, every year, Halloween in Texarkana in the park downtown, they play the movie. I guess mm. they put it on like a big screen or whatever. But that's like watching Titanic on a cruise ship. Fuck that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to do that shit. You don't want to go watch the uh, Jaws screening? Oh, no, in the fog. No, fucking in the flow. I would do no. it, but not for no 50 friggin' dollars. No, nah, dude, I wouldn't do it if you paid me $50. I've seen Jaws <laughs> on TV that. like four times in the last two weeks. I'd oh, my God. Spend $50 to float. float Fuck that shit. Some tepid water that everybody's been pissing in all night. Hell yeah, no. Pissy, tepid water. Tepid, Jaw pissy shark. water. <laughs> Jaw shark, tepid, pissy water. <laughs> Tissy, pepid water. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I mean, that's that's honestly that is the story of the Texarkana Moonlight Murders. That is episode fifteen. What do you think? Do you think it was Yule Swinney? It seems Based likely. Based off of what I said. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. But it sounds like that for the time, that but town what? was pretty crime-ridden. Anyway. It was crime-ridden. It reminds me so much of the Angel Resendez and how people in Houston were locking their doors. And But this is a whole nother level. You know what I mean? People mm-hmm. were making booby traps like Home Alone. And the entire town was literally blanketed in fear. I could not think of a better term to use. It's super interesting. Look it up. There's tons of shows and documentaries and articles about it. It's fantastic. It's been my absolute favorite story to research so far. Very nice. I learned some stuff. Episode 15, ladies and gentlemen, The Grave Matter. We would love to hear more from you. Check us out on our social media, Facebook and Instagram, of course. Uh, we need to get Twitter. Honestly, a lot of people have been trying to hit us up. We need to get Twitter. Well, you be in charge of Twitter. I don't do Twitter. Yeah, I mean either. I got Twitter like 10 years ago, whenever it was first new or whatever. God, and that I, was 10 years ago. Jesus. I don't know. Probably longer than that. I, I signed know. up I'm and so it was behind. like, so-and-so is following you. And I was like, well, tell him to stop that. And I immediately <laughs> logged out and I've never gone back. I was like, nope. That's weird. It's like, why are you following me? I have nothing. Not even a profile picture. This is creepy. Weird. Yep. I don't know. It's it's yeah, but we need to get on there. I don't even like Instagram. I can't figure that shit out for nothing. <laughs> I do my best, but I'm a Facebook lady. It's all good. I've mastered the Facebook. Whatever. Find us on Facebook. That's where most of our uh, followers are anyway. Um, that's because that's the one I hang out on. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We we love you guys so much. We'll see you next week for a wonderful episode sixteen. I can't believe we are getting up there. Uh, we're going to be at 20 before you know it, and then 50, and then 100, and God only knows. That's going to be mind-blowing. Please let us know if you have any cool stories that we should share, whether it's um, you know paranormal, whether it's conspiracy-related, uh, and, of course, whether it's true crime, serial killer-related. We'd love to hear everything, and we look forward to seeing you guys next week. Thank you so much. Later, weirdos. <laughs>